They were soldiers unlike any others before or since. Their nation was an armed camp. They knew no trade but war. In 480 BC, at a place called Thermopylae, they met an army a hundred times their size and stood their ground. For them, the trumpets never called retreat. Their name has become a synonym for hardship willingly endured and death stoically faced. If the city of the Spartans should be deserted, and nothing left but its temples and foundations, posterity would, I think, after a long lapse of time, be unwilling to believe that their power was as great as their renown. There are few monuments left to the mightiest state in ancient Greece. For the Spartans were defended not by walls, but by their warriors. A city well fortified, surrounded by brave men and not by bricks. Early in the 5th century BC, the Spartan defenses were put to their hardest test yet. The Persian king Xerxes, who ruled the greatest empire in the world, schemed to make it greater still by conquering the city-states of Greece. Invaders had long been drawn to the fertile valley of the Spartans, just as the Spartans themselves were centuries before. They were shielded, however, by their mountains and the sea. The true menace to Sparta lay within. Helots, they were called, captives. They were here before the Spartans, and they outnumbered them. But now the Helots toiled like sharecroppers. When a terrible earthquake shook Sparta, the Helots rose up. The revolt took several years to quash. Ever since, the Helots were kept in check by Sparta's soldiers, who went among them to kill the disloyal. Hostile to outsiders, fearful at home, Sparta was a regime like no other in history. Forever under the cloud of war, the entire nation lived like an army. We have been superior to all the Greeks, not because of the size of our city, nor the numbers of our men, but because the constitution we have established is like a military camp, well administered and rendering willing obedience to its officers. When the Persians marched on Greece, Sparta and its rivals ceased fighting among themselves. A small force, including 300 Spartans, was dispatched to hold off the Persians while the city-states organized. Among them, a warrior named Aristodemus. Like the others, he had prepared all his life for war, beginning at birth. Upon entering the world, a Spartan infant was examined by the city's elders. If it was not healthy and sturdy, it would be flung into a ravine on Mount Aegatus, 
and left to die. Surviving his first trial, Aristodemus was bathed not in water but wine to steal his constitution. Then he was handed over to a slave nurse. He would not be coddled. He was fed plain food and taught not to fear the dark or being alone. At seven, Aristodemus was enrolled in the state school, the Agoge. His life was now devoted to war. Of reading and writing, they learned only enough to serve their turn. All the rest of their training was calculated to make them obey commands well, endure hardships, and conquer in battle. The young Aristodemus was forbidden underclothes and shoes. Instead, he received a single cloak to last the whole year. During exercise, he went barefoot and naked. He was given no bed. He had to make his own from coarse rushes, plucked and twisted by hand. His diet was deliberately poor. To supplement it, he was encouraged to steal food, for someday his life might depend on living off the land. But if caught, he was beaten, first by the owner he had stolen from, then by his tutor, for getting caught. At 12, Aristodemus began training with weapons, the sword, the thrusting spear, and the bulwark of the Spartan army, the shield. It was a simple metal disc hammered over a wooden core. The warrior passed his left arm through a loop to a grip on the rim. A line of soldiers so protected formed a phalanx, a wall of shields, where the right side of each man was protected by the shield of the man beside him. So important was it that warriors were told to come back with their shields or on them. At 20, Aristodemus faced another rite of passage, the privilege